Welcome, what, no, just kidding. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Vise. There's Sooners YouTube Live. My name is Brandon Drum. As you can see, I'm in the lovely confines of an Indigo Hotel in uh, the Galleria area of Houston because I drove down for that crap, flew down for that crap today. Parker, how you doing? Well, I mean... I didn't drive down for that crap today, so perhaps a little bit better than you, Brandon, but I feel like everybody's kind of on the same plane right now. No, for real, congrats to the family, but we're going to have to get into how all this went down because uh, this was not what everybody expected. Uh, including you don't myself. Say. Uh, so, I guess I should probably, since I was the one up there, and tell everybody the behind behind the scenes stuff, and we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, number one, this thing. This predates the party in the palace. So I want everybody to understand that. Like this predates the party in the palace. The party in the palace, there was kind of an exclamation point on Oklahoma. And Hicks had been committed to Oklahoma for some time. Um, it, it was all of you. And he even got up to this miraculous speech of why he chose to, to visit Instead of going to the a &M deal, he came up with his grandparents and went to Oklahoma's party in the palace. And this is why he's going to Oklahoma and all this stuff, okay? 
at that point in time, there's a lot of buzz. A lot of the recruits were going, this kid's going to Oklahoma. Oklahoma even had him listed on their commitment board as committed for the last two and a half months. Like, that's where this thing was at. Fast forward to September. He goes to the Appalachian State game. He wanted to give a and a look, and that's what we were told. Everybody was told, just giving him a look. And at that time, it was very believable because Appalachian State lost. Oklahoma's defense looks amazing. So you can kind of see where this is going. He then goes to the Miami game. He wasn't supposed to be going to that, but he did, okay? The first game, he goes up last second with a friend, teammate that's committed to Texas A&M. And the second game, Miami, he goes up with family. So he decided he was going to go there. And he never made it back to Oklahoma. So it kind of got a little iffy. To, I wouldn't even say iffy because even then, all the right things were being said. Coach Bates goes down and sees – and watches his game on Friday. Everything's good then. Saturday, I record a video with Hicks saying, I'm going to Oklahoma. It's called Know Your Crew. Very well done, very well edited by our man Spencer Forsyth. I uh, even had the Know Your, you know, who is it, Parker, that you got Tom that Haverford of? from Parks and Recreation. Tom, yeah, Tom Haverford. There you go. And so um, we had all that, the voiceover and everything going. It was a really cool deal. And I know y'all want us to release that. We kind of talked about it. We're not going to do it. <laughs> so it was, it was discussed. We're not going to do it, okay? But he talks about why he was choosing Oklahoma. Monday rolls around, and you hear a little buzz, a little buzz about AM. and And I write about it. I'm like, look, they're doing all these zooms with them they're trying to get him they're talking to him but when you talk to the people around him i even got it's an 80 20 oklahoma still 80 20 oklahoma i see last night but oklahoma felt tight. was told they sent a tie oklahoma was going to be the choice the night before Everything worked out. Fast forward to midday today, and there was like an eerie feeling about things. Things went quiet. And so I show up early about 2 p.m. to Katie Paytel. And I talked to his dad, no indication that it's not going to be Oklahoma. So what happened was, is his dad said, pack your bag, whatever you need, whatever school you're going to choose from, pack it. And that's where you, you're going to go. You're going to announce up there. And it had been Oklahoma, had been Oklahoma, had been Oklahoma. His dad gets to the school. He opens his bag up. He sees it's A&M. Makes him call Coach Bates and all the other guys about 310-ish. So they were they came out a little late to even set up for the announcement, and everybody was wondering what was going on. And so, about that time, uh, his dad walks over to me, and it's about three fifteen, and says, "Hey, man, it's A and M." And that's where I put stuff up on the board. I'm like, "I think it's A and M." So um, that is how that went down. Now, how A and M flipped him, how they got him, you all can do all the, you know, speculating that you want. That's not what Parker and I are here to do because that will get us in deep trouble. That would, it's a, we have to go with facts. That's what we do as reporting. Everything is fact-based. It's a crappy deal what happened to Oklahoma today. You can't replace the number one player at his position, especially David Hicks. It can't be done. So what Oklahoma has to do is try to Find somebody and cross your fingers, somebody in the portal is going to happen. But at the same time, and people can say, oh, it's sunshine pumping. And I know Mr. Zach Williams said I'm going to sunshine pump. They have a five-star committed in uh, P.J. Atabari. They have a top 100 guy in Derek LeBlanc. How you doing? 
there, Mr. I hope everything's all good in Florida, Mr. Ricardo LeBlanc. There's our shout out. And number three, they have Colton Vasek, who will 100% be top 100 before it's all said and done. So you have those three. Oklahoma has to close out here, or it's just not going to look good. They got to close out on somebody else. You got to go get a Johnny Bowens. You got to go get a Caden McDonald, and you've got to go get, or you've got to go get a uh, Cecilia Kana. Has to happen. Or they've got to go find somebody else that's willing and kind of got their eye wandering somewhere else that's a top 100 guy and try to get them to take an official visit and see if they can flip them. That's it. It has to be done. I know Oklahoma, the people I've talked to, they feel like it is a kick in the nuts, and that's the best way you can put it, like multiple kicks in the nuts. Just they they feel it. They feel it inside the switcher center. But they're also saying they're going to rebound. And they're going to get back at this because they've always done it. Back at Clemson, Venables did it when he was at Oklahoma. They missed out on people and still ended up with great classes. So it can be done. But right now, you all being pissed, you deserve to be pissed. Everybody deserves to be mad. Be mad. Be upset. This thing was seemed like it was all set for Oklahoma. And once again, it, the rug got pulled out from underneath. So, yes, be mad about it. But also understand that they're recruiting at a level that hasn't ever happened on the defensive side of the ball. It's that still is taking place. And that can't be changed. As mad as you want to be, you still have to look at the positives too. Parker, go ahead. No, I mean, you said a lot of things that carry merit there. Uh, I'll, I'll just say this. There's no sugarcoating it. There's no downplaying it. This is a really tough loss for Oklahoma. And I've long maintained that I believe DJ Hicks is the best player in the 2023 class, regardless of position. And the Sooners were that close, that close to getting him on board. And then again, the rug gets pulled out from under them at the 11th (laughs) hour. And I think the hard thing for a lot of fans to swallow is that, man, this is three times in the last 10 months that this has happened with a top 10 overall prospect regardless of position at the defensive line position, most specifically. So you had Gabriel Brownlow Dindy, who I think was the number eight player in the 2022 Mm -hmm. cycle. Uh, You had LT Overton, who was the number four player in the 2023 cycle before he reclassified. And now you have DJ Hicks three times in the last 10 months, Texas A&M has made a late surge for a five-star defensive lineman and stolen him out from under OU's nose. The first two cases, you had legacies with GBD and LT Overton. Now you got a guy in DJ Hicks that while he wasn't a legacy, everything pointed in OU's direction for so long. (coughs) The party, the palace, it looked like it was a done deal, man. When he pushed up the commitment date, it looked like it was a done deal. There was not anything in the world that would have led you to believe credibly that DJ Hicks was going to end up making this decision here on September 28th. Now, again, uh, one of the, one of the things that has been rehashed on the message boards and on social media time and time and time again was why didn't people pay more attention to the fact that he visited Texas A&M twice, right before he made the decision. It's easy to say that, but then again, for the last two months in particular, every source from every side, every single day, has said one thing, and that's OU's in the driver's seat for DJ Hicks. It's OU's race to lose for DJ Hicks. Regardless of who you were talking to, regardless of what camp they were in, all the sources seem to say the exact same thing, which is DJ Hicks is going to be a Sooner. And so really the only way that you could look at the visits to Texas A&M and conclude that that was an issue. That was something, oh, you needed to be skeptical about. I mean, the, it boils down to sheer conjecture at that point. You're just, you're looking at appearances. But if you were following the intel, it all pointed to Oklahoma, man. And that's what makes this situation so unfortunate for Sooner fans uh, and why this one's going to hurt for a long time is because it's just not that often that you see a player of this caliber make such a stunning decision 
seemingly right before he walked to the podium. And I don't know how far in advance this was uh, set in motion, if you will. But the fact remains, as you mentioned, Brandon, he didn't let OU know he wasn't coming until literally right before he stepped on the podium to make the announcement. And it really, and I'm not saying it's a direct parallel here, but it almost brings back memories of the Tristan Lee situation where the kid and everybody in his corner were telling everybody all the right things about Oklahoma. And there was not a reason in the world to believe that he was not going to be a sooner. And then boom, at the 11th hour, he's gone just like that. So yeah, it sucks. If you're a sooner fan, it does. And the frustration is understandable and everybody is commiserating tonight. That's, that's why everybody's gathered here on the YouTube live. Most everybody thought it was going to be an evening of celebration and Oh, he was going to ascend to number two in the nation among the team recruiting rankings. And that was going to really garner some momentum down the home stretch for them to go and finish off the recruitments of guys like Peyton Bowen and Ryan Yates and to Celia Kana. And now, I mean, here we are, Brandon, the wind has been taken out of everybody's sails. And the natural question at this point becomes, well, where does OU go from here? Because if Texas A&M just pulled off such a stunning victory, in this head-to-head battle, as it pertains to DJ Hicks, who's to say they're not going to do the exact same thing with Peyton Bowen, who's the other five-star that Sooner fans have uh, believed for quite a while could ultimately end up a Sooner. And by no means has that ever been a sure thing, but there's been a lot of very strong intel that would suggest the Sooners end up with Bowen as well. And now as things stand, knowing that Texas A&M is in that race too, not nearly as convinced that Oklahoma is going to be able to close (laughs) that one out after what happened today. So, yeah, man, it just, it, it it almost feels surreal. It almost feels like a fever dream. Did that just really happen? But you you, life goes on, man. And that's, that's about all that can be said. I don't know what the path looks like from here. For Oklahoma, as it pertains to that position, I think the two names you mentioned uh, are the ones that are certainly at the top of the list as a replacement for Hicks and Caden McDonald and Johnny Bowens. But the harsh reality is you can't replace a guy like that one for one. You can't. Mm -hmm. That is a special, special talent. And not having him in an OU uniform really hurts and will continue to hurt if you're a Sooner fan. I mean, unless you got somebody in the portal like a – Gabriel Brownlow Dindy, if like he decided he wanted to transfer from AM or something like that, and Oklahoma was able to land that, that would be a good one for one. But at the same time, what are the odds of that happening? I mean, we don't, I'm just throwing a hypothetical out there. Look, we got people that are um, literally saying that Oklahoma can't recruit defensive line. They're no better than they've ever been. They're not going to land Zadavian Sims and David Stone next year. I mean, I'm around C4 more than anybody um, just because of my kid. And if Zanavian Sims doesn't choose Oklahoma, that would be 20 times more of a shock than David Hicks. Wouldn't you agree with that? I. That's a bold statement. Is it though? It, it is a bold statement because that was, I mean, you you've been covering recruiting a lot longer than I have, but when I think of where today ranks on the shock it scale, makes sense though. But no, this one makes sense. It's kind of like the same thing with David Hicks. Is he's got family, he's got little brothers and sisters that he's got to stay close to. Similarly, so does the Davian Sims and Durant. So that's why it would be shocking to me. And, and no, I, I get what you're saying. Like yeah, uh, both, yeah, and I think that's true. Time, yeah, I just. I, I think David Stone would he I think I think his recruitment if he doesn't end up in Oklahoma. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I mean, that now that I agree. I don't, with. I don't know what to tell you if that doesn't happen. Honestly, I just like, you know what? <laughs> just 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 get used to it. <laughs> uh but I mean, recruiting's never easy. I think that's something people need to understand. And everybody thinks that everything's just so fluid and so 
you know, it just, it just happens and it's easy to land these kids and all this stuff like fans just, and I, I, I'm not discounting you all's ability to understand. It's just that you don't, because you don't see it every day. You see what we present to you and that's what you see. You don't see everything that's going on behind the scenes. You don't hear everything that's going on because we can't tell you everything that we hear from behind the scenes. So there is so much that goes on that when something like this happens, if you all think you all take it hard, try the coach that's put 5,000 hours into this kid over the last three years and had him and his family feeling like they were Sooners only to be told 10 minutes before he gets on the stage to go to another school that now he's not coming to your school. That has to hurt worse than anything else. But I'll tell you this, if anybody in the country is going to be able to rebound back from that and recruit at a high level, I will bet on Todd Bates only because he's done it for years and years and years. You can't, you can't just throw away everything that he's done. Remember, Derek LeBlanc was supposed to be going to Florida. And everybody says, follow the visits. Derek LeBlanc visited, and I, I, that's my number one rule. And people are saying, I didn't follow my number one rule. But the reason why I didn't is because Derek LeBlanc visited Florida right before he committed to Oklahoma. And I was told the same thing about Derek LeBlanc that I was told about David Hicks. Already committed. So you start to believe those things because you have a history, you have a precedent of it. Same thing with P.J. Atabari, same thing with Colton Bassick. Like Colton Bassick, I think everybody's mad now, but remember, you all are the flip side now of what Texas was. Because remember, that kid was going to Texas. Remember, he's a Texas legacy, yada, yada, yada. And he commits to Oklahoma out of the blue, mind you, because he wasn't supposed to announce at that point. He just goes, hey, I'm going to announce tomorrow. And it was Oklahoma. So it, it works in your favor sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. And I'm telling you, I know it stings for you all. I promise you there's nobody more mad than this guy right here that left his kids and his wife because he thought he was going to be covering a story that uh, he was going to Oklahoma for you all only to get there 10 minutes before they announced now it's not Oklahoma I'm just as pissed as everybody else I'm just as pissed as everybody else Parker if you had to guess right now where does Oklahoma end up in the rankings and who do they close out with on the defensive side of the ball if you had to guess and I know nobody wants to hear sunshine pumping this isn't sunshine we're literally guessing so take it for what it is. Yeah. Um, as I said, it's it's admittedly more difficult to believe that Oklahoma can go close on Peyton Bowen now because of what just happened with DJ Hicks. So I, I'm not saying it's an impossibility, but <laughs> I think if you're being honest with yourself, your confidence has understandably diminished after today because that's another five-star that a and will no doubt feel a lot more confidence themselves to make a push for down the stretch. So I, I just don't think that's one you can count on by any means. And not that it ever was one that you could a hundred percent count on, but even less. So now uh, I would say that if I had to guess, OU finishes out this class with also they I'll say they get Marvin Burks and Rohan Fluellen at the safety spots and at the defensive line man I I guess Johnny Bowens is the safe bet because he was committed to Texas A&M for quite a while but obviously decommitted and is still looking heavy at A&M but Maybe he sees the fact that they just brought in DJ Hicks and says, hey, you know what? That, yeah. Screw that. I want to stick it to him. I'm going to go to Oklahoma. That that would make a lot of sense on paper. Uh, I, 
I've never really bought it with Caden McDonald's. I still don't. Uh, I got to see him not only make an official visit, but uh, I, I, I think I, what I really need, what I really worry about in the end is the barrier of distance. And that's something we've talked quite a bit about with him, Brandon. So yes, uh, I would say right now, Johnny Bowens, Marvin Burks, Rohan Fluellen, if I had to guess. And by no means am I conceding Peyton Bowen, Ryan Yates, but I think everybody who's looking at this objectively has to acknowledge the fact that DJ Hicks went A&M today has to tank the confidence a little bit with Bowen yeah. and thus as a byproduct with Yates. I'm actually going to stick with Yates. Okay. Picking Oklahoma in the end. I'm going to stick with that. I'm going to say Rohan Fluellen and Ryan Yates. And honestly, I if they don't get Yates, I'm going to say Morgan Pearson will be the other safety if they don't. If I would say Morgan Pearson and Rohan Fluellen if they don't get Yates. Because I don't know that – there's a lot going on with the whole Missouri thing. Uh, Marvin's single-family home, getting away from mom – Missouri only being like an hour and a half from his home. I mean, there's a there's a lot th- lot that could play into that too. So that that's why I'm going to choose Ryan Yates and uh, Rohan Fluellen at the safety at the defensive line. I mean, did did you pick Akana still? Did you pick? Oh Akana? well, yeah. I'd I'd I completely neglect because I was I was thinking interior and safety, but yeah, I would yeah. I believe they get Akana. I still do believe that. Okay. Yeah, I was going to go with Conan, and I'll, I'll, I'm, I guess Johnny Bowens, but I, I still think Johnny Bowens may end up at A&M still. So I don't know. I mean, that's, yeah, I, I mean. He, How many he, defensive uh, linemen can that school but take? Here's man? the thing. Yeah, but here's the thing. Here's the thing is, and I, I'm with you that I think maybe the David Hicks thing maybe pushes things and the fact that he's teammates with Anthony Evans and they're really good friends, yeah. pushes things in Oklahoma's favor. But at the same time, Oklahoma came in so late with him. Like they were late. So there, and I, I'm going I'm to throw a name out there for everybody that I think I'm not saying he's going to be in the class. Preface this, read my lips. I'm not saying he's going to be in the class and he isn't on the defensive side of the ball. Pay attention to Jaden Greyhouse. Just pay attention to him. Because I think Oklahoma is doing some solid recruiting with him right now. I do. I don't know that. I don't know that for a fact. I just know I've heard buzz from people in Austin about it. And I've heard I've heard other places too. Well consider this. Um, If 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 there was a world in which Oklahoma got Jaden Greathouse, they'd have both the offensive MVP and the defensive MVP of last year's 6A state championship game in the state of Texas uh, in Greathouse and Colton Vosick. And you can imagine Jackson Arnold is more than thrilled to have Colton Vosick in his same color uniform going forward because Vosick made Jackson Arnold's life hell in that state championship game. Even though Arnold had, hey, he turned in a really gritty performance. And Right. Uh, there were not a not a whole lot of folks that expected Geyer to be in that game the way that they were down the stretch, uh, if not for the performance of Arnold. Uh, <laughs> by the way, uh, need to throw this out there to everybody watching. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, because as I mentioned last week, 60% of the people that watch this live stream every week aren't subscribed. Hey, we do a lot of content throughout the week, not just this stream, uh, but we'll do breakdown videos. We'll do game previews. We do podcasts. Uh, trying to think. I eventually, know your crew is going to come. Yeah, no, no, your crew. Eventually, we'll roll that out, even if not tomorrow. It's supposed to be this week. Um, <laughs> press conferences with coaches and players, post practice availability sessions, all that. Really easy way to make sure you never miss a thing on this channel because we do our best to make sure uh, that whatever's going on, we have it all covered, both at ouinsider.com and here on the YouTube channel. So. Subscribe if you have not already. Uh, thanks to all of you who have tuned in tonight. This is, as we anticipated, one of our most watched shows ever uh, because people are commiserating. And it was it was it was going to be a big show tonight, one way or another, Brandon, because everybody was either going to be celebrating or they were all going to be sharing in disappointment. And unfortunately, it is the latter. But we have 
a couple questions that I want to get to. Um, but hey, why you before you ask that, I wanted to throw this out there. So yeah. if Oklahoma was to land to Celia Connor, uh, Ryan Yates, Johnny Bowens, and Marvin Burks, just to get them to twenty six, and that's just you know that's that would get them to almost two ninety three on the points before the next um, update, which is going to happen in the middle of October. So the, the composites are going to change as well. And we think that Oklahoma is going to move up even higher because their their guys are playing so well. So Oklahoma will probably be creeping up close to 300 regardless of what they do. And that ought to tell you, well, right now, no matter how mad you are, how well they are recruiting. As a and, whole. and 300 is traditionally kind of the benchmark. That's where you cross the line from being a great recruiting class to being a truly elite recruiting class. Mm -hmm. So if Oklahoma can break that 300 barrier, hey, that's a statement. And nobody should be disappointed with that haul in year one for BV and this staff. And again, as I mentioned, the loss of DJ Hicks is going to sting. It's going to hurt. There's no two ways about it. He's going to have a ton of success at the next level. And there will be a lot of folks uh, that watch the way his collegiate career unfolds and continually say, exactly. what if? Because the thought of him being in a Sooner uniform right. is never going to be any less tantalizing. But if the Sooners approach or break the 300 barrier, man, in year one, that's still a massive win as far as recruiting for this staff. But I'll add this, and this kind of rolls into the question, uh, one of the questions that was asked earlier in the stream, does the loss of DJ Hicks once again, open up the possibility that OU and Malachi Coleman could get back together in a sense, because uh, as we reported over on OUinsider.com, seems that the Sooners and the four-star athlete out of Lincoln, Nebraska have kind of gone separate directions over the last week or so. And uh, I've long said that look, I think the Sooners have Malachi Coleman in the palm of their hand if they want him. But uh, with the numbers situation, not just at tight end, but across the roster, uh, it's looking increasingly unlikely that they're going to make room for Coleman as a second take at the tight end position, along with Cade McIntyre. And I, we're, I know we've already gotten a ton of questions about the whole numbers thing, and I know we'll get more in the chat. So let me just kind of mm. hash that out in a little bit more detail. When you look at numbers and to kind of bring the thought to completion there, the Sooners are in all likelihood going to look to the portal for an experienced tight end at the end of the year, because if they were to take Coleman and have four scholarship tight ends heading into next year, their most experienced player at that position is a true sophomore. You got two of them in Caden Helms and Jason Llewellyn, but those guys between them have one collegiate catch right now. So not a ton of experience at the tight end position heading into 2023. And one way or another, it always seemed that OU was going to go into the portal for an upperclassman tight end at the end of the season, regardless of how many they took. So that's what you have to keep in mind. The fact that it's looking like the Sooners are going to carry four scholarship tight ends into 2023. There was a time where it looked like they may carry five and that's why they initially were recruiting for two spots at the tight end position. McIntyre uh, jumped on board with Oklahoma in early June. So that was one. And then for the longest time, the second one, the guy that uh, the Sooners had had their eyes on was Malachi Coleman. But uh, as we talked about at six foot five, 205 pounds, uh, he needs some work in terms of building muscle, in terms of filling out that frame before he's truly ready to play tight end as opposed to wide receiver. And moreover, while the Sooners may have been open to carrying five scholarship tight ends three months ago, you look at the way that the roster has evolved since then, and there are positions of legitimate need and more pressing need. I would say Brent Venables just talked in his press conference yesterday about, about how thin the Sooners are at the linebacker position. And that's another group where you're going to have a lot of inexperience next year because you're not going to get TD roof back. There's a good chance. David Aguebu makes the jump to the NFL. Not a, not a sure thing, but there's a chance he makes the jump. You lost Joseph Wete. Uh, and so at this point you have um, among the guys that would be coming back, 
Danny Stutzman, Shane Witter, Jaron Kanick, and then two guys that are redshirting this year in Kobe McKenzie and Kip Lewis, as well as a fourfold crop of true freshmen. So similarly, not a ton of experience depth at that position. So while the Sooners may have been open to carrying five scholarship tight ends at a certain point in the past, I think that since then, uh, they've more warmed up to the idea of only carrying four and reallocating that fifth scholarship elsewhere at a position like linebacker for a more experienced guy. And so that's part of the reason why OU and Coleman have kind of seen their paths diverge. Coleman just announced earlier this evening uh, that he's going to be taking an official visit to Miami on October 8th, a week after he oh, OBs with Ole Miss. Look, that kid loves OU. If there was ever a time that the OU staff wanted to circle back around with him, uh, I don't question that he'd be willing to jump on board in a heartbeat. But here's what a lot of people don't know. And I just reported this on OU Insider earlier today for the very first time, because quite frankly, I'd overlooked it to this point. It was something I picked up on quite a while back, and it wasn't really pertinent until now. Uh, back in June, Malachi Coleman set a visit to OU for June the 10th. That was the same weekend that Colton Vosick was in town. It was actually mm -hmm. the same weekend that Cade McIntyre committed to OU. So that was kind of, that was right after the champion barbecue. There were a few stragglers that were taken officials and unofficials that weekend. I think Caleb Hicks might've been in town that weekend too. Uh, regardless, Malachi Coleman had that date set for a visit about a month beforehand. And the OU staff tried to get him to make it an official visit. They wanted to give him the OV experience. He declined, said he wanted to keep it unofficial, and so just did the trip on his own dime. Obviously, anybody that OU hosts on an OV, that's somebody that they're willing to take and are going to press hard to take. I think that Malachi Coleman, by virtue of not making that visit an official on June 10th, uh, I'm not, I don't want to say kind of set himself behind the eight ball, but it made him less of a priority for Oklahoma than a lot of other guys in this class by simple virtue of the fact that they weren't really sure yet how serious he was about OU. And as the relationship with Joe John Finley evolved, he eventually became more and more and more serious about OU to the point where and you got to late August, it looked for all the world like, that kid was going to be a sooner, but at the same time, by that point, things have changed. Things have evolved. The numbers situation isn't what it was three months ago. And here we are talking about how uh, Oklahoma might not end up taking a top 100 player nationally. But uh, my belief on the situation, especially and what, what happened today with DJ Hicks kind of underscores this reality. The staff has talked so much about how, they want guys that want to be at Oklahoma, right? Mm -hmm. And for that reason, and Malachi Coleman to me is just one of he's he's one of those guys that you got to take because if he doesn't end up being a tight end, hey, that's fine. You know, I on the radio today I was having a discussion with Mike Steely about this, and uh, we were rehashing some of Bob Stoops' comments about Dan Cody, who obviously became a great in the Crimson and Cream and went on to have an NFL career. When Bob Stoops was recruiting Dan Cody, uh, he said, look, I, I don't know what the guy's going to become. I know he's a football player, and I need those guys at Oklahoma. Malachi Coleman's one of those guys to me. Is he your prototypical tight end? No, no. not necessarily. But is he a crazy athlete with a freakish skill set that has the opportunity to be truly special if he's developed properly? Yes, and I don't think you need to pigeonhole him into one position necessarily to get really good football out of him. So that kind of brings you up to speed on the situation. Right now, I don't think Coleman stays home and goes to Nebraska. I just don't foresee that happening. I think that's why you've seen him move to set the official visit with Miami. The contact with OU has kind of trailed off over the last week or so. And I think he's kind of started to clue into the fact that I probably need to explore a couple other options here. So he's going to OV with Ole Miss. He's going to OV with Miami. Uh, but man, especially in light of what happened today, uh, I, 
I would circle back on Malachi Coleman if I were OU. Then again, those coaches get paid a heck of a lot more money to make a heck of a lot more important decisions than the ones I make, right? So uh, you're going to trust their vision and what they have planned for the roster and more specifically the tight end room. Uh, but that is where the Malachi Coleman recruitment sits right now as far as OU is concerned. Can, can we can we put a petition up, by the way, to uh, – I was just sitting here while you were talking thinking of all the Katie recruits that Oklahoma has been in on and just whiffed in the last day of their recruitment. And Glass Foster, David Higgs, there are several others out there. Um, can there be a petition that Oklahoma just doesn't recruit the town of Katy? <laughs> the school, the KDISD. Just stay away from KDISD. Don't hey, it, it, it's worked out. They got the Andersons from Katie. They they do get the, they yeah, got they uh, the David Aguayo from Katie. Stripling, obviously. So stripling, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I guess to an extent, yeah. I, I got Seven Lakes, uh, the Katie High School, and a couple of those other guys. But man, there's been some big heartbreaks though too with some big names that Oklahoma is right there and then there's rug right from uh, right up from underneath them. All right, let's, let's talk a little TCU though. Okay. Oklahoma's kicking off playing TCU down in Fort Worth at 11 a.m. Uh, before we do that though, uh, Parker, you will be, I will be at Denton Geyer watching Ryan Yates, Jackson Arnold and Peyton one, the, the, the trio that, OU fans just love to talk about. Uh, I'm sure they're actually pretty tired of it by now, but Parker, where will you be? So Sorry. I'm going to go see Norman North tomorrow night. Uh, obviously, OU running back Chapman McCown, or running back commit Chapman McCown, excuse me, going to be in action. Parker um, Andrews. Mm. Yeah, as well as Parker Andrews. Uh, potential Utley. 2024 offensive line target Harrison Utley as well. Utley, that's a guy yeah. that's on OU's radar. Um, and I really, really like, I don't think he's going to be an OU guy in the end, but uh, I really, really like Norman North's quarterback, Camden Six Killer. Uh, Gavin Frakes, yeah, he's who good. played quarterback at Norman North last year, uh, has already won the starting job out at New Mexico State. I think Six Killer could have a similar wow. career trajectory. Um, but th- uh, then come Friday, I'm going to be down at Allen. I'm going to be seeing 2024 four star quarterback, Michael Hawkins as well as 2025 five-star tight end Devon Mitchell and high four-star 2024 edge rusher Zena Amozola, as well as 2025 quarterback Kevin Sperry, another guy who's yep. on OU's radar. Uh, worth keeping an eye on C4. in that cycle. Another C4 guy, yes. So Allen and Rock Hill is where I'm going to be Friday night. Nice. All right, I will be watching uh... – McKinney Boyd play at uh, obviously Denton Geyer. So I'll have some information on uh, Yates and all those guys. I do think Yates does take a visit to Oklahoma before this is all said and done. So I'll say that. When? I don't know. Um, I might, but, you know, it's just something that uh, isn't, isn't like, it's just something that is like on the LO right now that, I don't know that he is actually going to get on the visit. It's just, it's been talked about. So we'll see with that. Uh, it's, but it's always with him and Peyton, it's always, we'll see. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. So uh, LSU is pretty hard after him right now. Same with uh, Notre Dame with Peyton Bowen. He has a November 5th uh, visit Peyton Bowen I'm talking about when Notre Dame takes on Clemson in South Bend. I don't know that he makes it to that trip, but we'll see. We'll see. They did the hashtag books thing, and I don't know that I'd buy that because I talked to somebody earlier today, and they were like, that is not set in stone. Regardless of what Notre Dame people are saying, it is not set in stone. That's the plan, but it is not set in stone. So anyways, um, Oklahoma, though, is taking on TCU this weekend, 11 a.m. kickoff. It's on Fox, right? Is it Fox or is it ABC? Do you remember? I don't ever pay attention to that stuff because we're there. So I believe I it's know. Fox. Yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> I was like, we're there. We don't, we don't ever pay attention to the TV. Um, but yeah, uh, 
so everybody's asking I said hi to uh, LeBlanc. Yes, I have. Uh, but so they're taking on a teacher. I think, and Parker, you and I have talked about this. I think Oklahoma fans should be worried. No, I think Oklahoma is going to go down there and they're going to handle business. I believe that wholeheartedly. Do you believe that as well, Parker? I believe that. Yes. I also think. I believe it. Yeah, no, TCU is going to present a challenge, and I don't think it's going to be a runaway by any means. I, don't, because, I, don't know. I think. Yeah, you do see a lot I of think, parallels between Max yeah. Duggan and Adrian. That's where Martin. I was going with this. That's so, where I was going with this. Yeah, we're so, going to we're going to find out very quickly whether Oklahoma has been able to apply the lessons they learned last week on the practice field throughout mm-hmm. the week, and whether that's going to manifest on the field this Saturday. I just I think it's pivotal uh, that you get two guys involved early on offensively. Uh, obviously the easy answer is Eric Gray, but that's because you have to establish the run just in general, but uh, you really got to get Braden Willis involved earlier in my mind. And then you got to get the ball in Marvin Mims hands. This was really, I mean, this was the game two years ago where he had his coming out party, his best performance as a freshman uh, came in Amon G Carter stadium against the Horn Frogs. He had four catches, 132 yards and two touchdowns uh, scoring plays of 50 and 61 yards respectively. So uh, if Mims does what he does the last time the Sooners made the trip down to Fort Worth, I don't question that they're going to put up a lot of points on a TCU defense that is not superb and be able to put enough distance between themselves and the Horn Frogs that they'll be able to come out victorious. Kit, is this Zach Williams guy in the chat? Is he an Oklahoma fan? Because everything he said so far has been like, oh, he's going to get this against them and they're going to lose that and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And they can't stop this or that, or Quinn Ewers is going to kill uh, Oklahoma if they play him and he's healthy. Like, dude, <laughs> they just a lot – like Quinn Ewers, I don't think he's a massive difference between him and Hudson Card. I don't. Like, Hudson Card played just as well as Quinn Ewers did against Alabama. Like, just as well. And we don't know if Alabama would have stopped Ewers. Like, I think Ewers is a really good player. I also think Hudson Card's a good player. And I don't know, man. I, I Everybody's getting the, you know, car for the horses. We're talking about Texas. Like, who gives a crap? And Quinn Johnson is going to be a problem. Quinn Johnson problems no matter who it is. So if I'm Oklahoma, I make sure that I have DJ Graham on him or, a, or Woody Washington or – um, trying to think who else who else do they play at corner quite a bit now they've rotated so many guys can I Walker um, saw quite a few snaps out there last can I Walker that's what I'm thinking yeah that's why I think you, you stick on Quentin Johnson stick the big guy on him he's 6'2 six, 6'3 six, see what he can do um, I, I just I don't know man you, you talked about Max Duggan that's what I was going to get into that there's just there's a lot of parallels between him and uh, Martinez and I just if Oklahoma, like that last play, Parker broke it down, but I'm going to break it down a little bit more. That third and 16, the 52-yard run. If you go back and watch it, there's one man free the whole time. One man free. Deshaun White. Deshaun White started at about 8 to 10 yards when the ball was snapped. But for some odd reason, he, and he's supposed to spy. You can tell he's supposed to spy because of where he was lined up. He kept sinking further and further and further back. He got about 20 to 25 yards deep by the time Martinez started to break. If they can break the stupid penalties, if they can break the false starts, if they can break the stupid things that they've done defensively, not wrapping up, just simple mistakes that are so fixable. They're so fixable. If they can fix those problems, I think this Oklahoma team can be really good. I do. Now, I, I think another thing we need to address, Parker, is the Dylan Gabriel hate. Like, why? He missed the throw, two throws to Stoops, so everybody's going to hate on him? Those throws didn't make or break the game. They would have helped, but they didn't make or break the game. There were a thousand other plays that happened during that ball game where the defense and the defense needs to take ownership and it's really screwed up or somebody false started on the offensive line after they got two or three first downs and ruined the momentum as they were driving down. 
those are the things you look at. You don't look at a dude that threw for 330 yards and ran for 80, right? Like that stupid 410 problem. He was the problem, Parker. That's what some of the fans think. Yeah, what, I mean, it's, what, what world are we in? Well, here, here's here's the thing, Brandon. You got it. And I I had a knee jerk reaction in the aftermath of that game, and <laughs> I got a little bit combative on social media with a couple folks who were critical of Gabriel's play. But here's what I realized, and uh, after I had the chance to chew on it a little bit, I came to the uh, realization that look, you have to you have to take this in the proper context because for the last seven years. Oklahoma fans have been accustomed to having a quarterback at the helm that can just go bombs away at any given moment and pretty much blaze them to victory, regardless of how badly the defense plays. And Dylan Gabriel is not that guy, I, but he, he, he wasn't brought in to be that guy. He wasn't recruited from the transfer portal to be that guy. He was recruited to be the steady hand of the tiller in the offense, a guy that doesn't turn the ball over, throws a very accurate deep ball for the most part, and has some understated running ability that makes him dangerous in Levy's offense. Mm -hmm. The familiarity doesn't hurt as well. But OU fans have been very, very spoiled with elite quarterback play for the last seven seasons, whether it was Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts, and in spurts, Spencer Rattler and Caleb Williams, right? So yeah. it's that combined with the stigma of poor defensive play in Norman that I think has contributed to the criticism of Gabriel because, again, these fans are simply accustomed to having a quarterback that firebombs them to victory with 45, 50, 55 points on any given Saturday, regardless of how the defense plays, that – they have lost the proper context for how football games are won, which are on both sides of the ball. And you can point to one or two plays, sure, where Dylan Gabriel cost the Sooners. You can point to 15 or 20 plays minimum mm -hmm. where one of those defensive 11 slipped up or multiple slipped up and that burned the Sooners. And there was poor tackling. Uh, there was poor execution. Yeah. There was a lack of pressure on the quarterback. Uh, there were some bad angles taken. There were some bad penalties. Uh, and in general, it just was it was a sloppy defensive game. And in reality, 34 points and 550 yards of offense should be enough to win you a game in the Big 12. It should. <laughs> Every and so, time. Uh, would, you, would you have liked Dylan Gabriel to make a couple of those throws? Sure. But you also must acknowledge that he shouldn't have to make every single throw. And heck, Bob Stoops said this earlier in the week. There are NFL guys that miss those throws. Find me an NFL quarterback that goes an entire game without missing a throw or two. All right. Mm -hmm. So the best of the best of the best are going to have an errant throw every now and again. That doesn't take away from the larger narrative, which is that Dylan Gabriel has been pretty dang efficient for Oklahoma and pretty dang effective at the quarterback position. 13 total touchdowns and no turnovers, I believe, through four games. So uh, he is not the problem. Does he have some things to correct? Sure, he will be the first one to admit that. That was all he wanted yeah. to talk about Saturday night after the game was how they needed to be better and how that started with him. But... It's also fair to say, and in fact, quite fairer to say that he is far, far, far down the list of things that need to be corrected in order for the Sooners to get back to playing winning football. Yeah, no, he he's he's never going to be like if you put him and I mean, even Caleb Williams, if you put them up next to each other and you said, who's the most talented, who's going to be this or that in the NFL? You're going to say Caleb Williams every time. Like, yes, Oklahoma lost a player. They replaced him with one of the best transfer quarterbacks that there was out there, period. And he's a really good player. 
So, I mean, you you can't hate on a guy, especially a guy that's thrown for 11 touchdowns and zero interceptions and over 1,000 yards, and he's at, what, 68% on the season throwing. You better be able to win some ball games with the quarterback doing that because he's not he's not putting you in precarious positions. He's actually helping the defense out. The defense is putting themselves in a bad position. And I know that people want to say, oh, Oklahoma played – three cupcakes and they did this and they got exposed and they did this and that on the defensive side of the ball. Offensively, Nebraska is way better than K-State, way better. Oklahoma came in unfocused. They had an awful Tuesday at practice. And I talked to some people this week. I said, hey, was your practice better on Tuesday than it was last week? And they said, oh my gosh, so much better. He said that you can tell the focus is there nobody's out there reading their press clippings. This team has been humbled. Now they've got to prove it this Saturday. They have to prove it this Saturday. If they go out and they handle business and say they go out and they win, let's say they win 35-14, I think Oklahoma fans are going to be okay with that on the road. Even if they won 35-17, you're going to walk away and go, that was a good win. That was a good defensive performance. That was a solid offensive performance. Now you're going to roll into Texas and see what you can do against the Longhorns in Dallas. And I think if both teams can handle business, because I'm not so sure West Virginia doesn't shock Texas. I don't know what this Texas team is. After now they already have two losses. Is the culture that much different that they don't just start – everything doesn't start rolling downhill against them again like they have in previous seasons? We don't know that for a fact. We can talk about it and say we think that Sark's got that thing going in the right direction. But I think this West Virginia game is super telling about who Texas is going to be moving forward. Because if they go out and they lose to the last place team in the Big 12, ugh. I mean, they've done it before at home, right? They did it last year. They didn't 2016. It's not the last time. Or not the first time, I mean. So I'm really anxious to see what Texas does because I think that's going to be pretty telling of what this Cotton Bowl is going to be like because I think if Texas goes out and handles business and really takes care of West Virginia, I think people will start talking about them and giving – I don't think they're going to be in the top 25 by any stretch, but I think they'll start getting top 25 votes from some people. And I think that will up the ante for what that game – is I already think it's going to be an intense ball game as it always is, but there's a lot riding on the line between Venables and Sark. But I think at the same time, if neither one of the teams handle business this week, it doesn't matter. That game's just going to be a game. And I don't think that's something Oklahoma fans want. I know it's not something Texas fans want. So if you're, what, what, what's your predicted score this week, by the way? Ooh, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about this yet. Uh, offhand, I'm going to say Oklahoma 45, TCU 31. Was that the score last year when they played? 45, 31? I think it was. Okay. No, gonna... no, it was 52. It was like 52, 13 or something like that. 52, 20, right? I I don't remember exactly. Um, I'll say – <laughs> go ahead go ahead keep going keep going uh I'm looking it up yeah also I'll, I'll i'll roll with that 45 31 um i think the sooners just have a little bit more firepower and i think the defense yields a little bit to max duggan in this offensive attack i think quentin johnson's a miss uh mismatch 52 31 52 31 okay so yeah it was 45 31 till the very end yeah um yep when oh you poured on a garbage time score to my recollection but yeah i'll say 45 31 like i said oklahoma just has a few more horses quentin johnston is a mismatch regardless of who you line him up against so he's going to get his tcu is going to string some drives together they're going to put up some points but in the end i think ou's defense does enough to give the offense a comfortable cushion and i think this game is going to be well in hand from halftime on not a blowout by any means, but certainly in hand. And I think Oklahoma will do enough down the stretch to maintain on the road. 
So you said 45-31? You think TCU's 30, 30, 31 points? Yes. Oof. That will not be a good look for the defense. Uh, you don't have faith in the defense, I can tell at this point. <laughs> well, it's not that I don't have faith in the defense. I think you just you got to give flowers to a good offense when you see one. And TCU has a really good offense. Max Duggan has eight well, touchdowns good. and no yeah. interceptions this year. Um, hmm. I don't, I don't think it's a belly flop of a performance if the Sooners give up thirty-one points. Um, I'm gonna go. Forty-one. I'm gonna say forty-one twenty-one. That's my that's my that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Forty-one twenty-one, Oklahoma. I think that this Oklahoma team wakes up. I think they play well. I think they, I think they play well the rest of the season. Honestly, like that's that's my gut feeling at this point. And Parker and I talked about this in the post game podcast. We both think they're probably a ten and two team. I think we we both said eleven and one, ten and two, ish was going to be our. It was kind of where we set the the bar with them, uh, and I think we still feel that way. You still feel that way even after sitting on it and thinking about it a little bit, Parker. I do. Okay. All right. Well, I know you fans. I know you guys are upset. I know you guys. What, hold on, hold on. This Oklahoma lawn guy keeps saying that. I, I, I guess I said something that I, I, forty-one twenty-one was was that not was that too good, Oklahoma lawn guy? I guess I don't know, man. Sometimes in the in the chat they're saying really, Brandon. Like I like I I guess I don't know what I said that was so wrong. So I don't know. I don't know, man. But anyways. Um, yeah, uh, it's tough time for Oklahoma, man. Uh, bad week, obviously. Um, you never want to lose, but you never want to lose out on the top recruit either. So especially one that's been committed to you for a couple months, <laughs> suddenly. So uh, do you have any final thoughts, Parker, on everything? Well, that's look, it's the, the last five days have been a pretty hefty one-two punch for the Sooners. But I think if there is a silver lining, it's that I know it's cliche, but all of their goals are still out in front of them for the 2022 season. And you can certainly hope and you'd expect to a certain extent that the Kansas State game was the worst game Oklahoma's going you know, to play all year defensively. Mm -hmm. If that is their worst game, and if they are able to take the lessons they learned apply them in film study and on the practice field throughout the week and come out reinvigorated Saturday, then this is a team that can catch fire. And uh, this is a team that can go the distance in the big 12. And moreover, uh, they're still in position to outpace what our expectations were from a recruiting perspective in year one under Brent Venables. So yeah, I, I, I'm not trying to downplay the loss of DJ Hicks. He's an outstanding football player. As I've said many times, in my mind, the best player in the country right now in that 2023 mm -hmm. cycle. So that one's going to hurt. But I promise you this, there's one thing we know about Venables and Bates when you look at their track record over the years. With them, uh, they have the capacity to develop players that aren't elite. And it helps to have those elite guys, sure. And the Sooners got a trio of them right now in Colton Vosick, Derek LeBlanc, and P.J. Adebare. But I think about a guy like James Skulski at Clemson, right? N nobody would have figured that he was going to end up being the keystone of Brent Venable's defense uh, by the time. Was it he Burley? Was, was Burley was the, 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 was Burley? Was that 2015? Was it Vic Burley or was, what was his name? Um, Beasley? Was it, it wasn't Vic Beasley. Vic Beasley. Right? Vic Beasley. Well, was he a from Clemson, right? Yes. Yes. Converted tight end. He was a two-star tight end coming out of high school. Yeah. So and they can. Yeah. Yeah. So look, uh, at the end of the day, you'd love to have a c class that's stocked with elite talent. And I think the Sooners have plenty of that. But uh, you got to have faith at this point that regardless of who 
Venables and Bates end up taking to fill the void that is created by the loss of DJ Hicks. Uh, it's going to be a guy that they're confident can be a player at the University of Oklahoma, can be mm-hmm. a stud. And I'll add this as well. Our Mason Thomas, who was a late take that probably not a whole lot of folks paid attention to, attention to relatively speaking, when he flipped from Iowa State to OU on National Signing Day, I would venture a guess, and I don't have the class in front of me, but I would figure he's already accomplished more having seen the field in two games as a true freshman than a lot of the players that were ranked higher than him at the edge position. So there's something to be said for finding the diamond in the rough. And I believe this staff Staff certainly certainly has the capacity to do that to a certain extent. They've already proven that they can do that. So with the combination of elite top shelf talent and really solid mid range evals by this coaching staff, I don't question that the defensive future in Norman is still very, very bright. So I know not everybody's looking for the silver lining on a night like tonight, but it's there. It's there. And it'll become easier to see down the line. People are miserable right now and understandably so, but it gets better. And Hey, it could be a whole heck of a lot worse. Could not, not have, I mean, you could have a program that isn't in the top 10 in recruiting and could be on the verge of losing three straight games, even after they got the number one defense alignment. So, I mean, could be that. I mean, <laughs> so uh, there's no shots fired there, was there? I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> Um, anyways, I don't know people pick up on that. So I, I, I'm with you. Uh, it could be worse. And people are asking, has Bates landed anybody? But Derek LeBlanc's pretty good. He's pretty good. Now, Chavis has obviously uh, Atabori and Vasek. But I promise you, Bates is going to land his guys. When he came in, Jeffrey Johnson was considered the top defensive lineman in the portal. Oklahoma got it. They're going to have other guys transfer to Oklahoma. There are going to be guys that they're going to land that are big name guys moving forward. I know that it's been said in the chat, David Stone, that everybody thinks he's not going to go to Oklahoma because David Hicks, David Hicks doesn't have anything to do with David Stone at all. He's told everybody it would be cool to play for him. I mean, he told me that or play with him alongside him, but that doesn't mean that they're like best buds or friends. He's, a, he's an Oklahoma kid that has been recruiting guys to Oklahoma, literally. Did you – Go ahead. Can I, can I interject? Go ahead. Did you see David Stone's tweet eight minutes ago? What was it? NIL, and I'm, I'm reading directly. This is a direct quote. NIL will not be the reason I go to a school to play football, so do not make the assumption again that I can be bought. Timeless. There you go, Sooners fans. There you go. I think this is something that Parker and I knew about the kid. He is he is very much a look in the distance, see what the future holds type of kid. That's why he went down. I don't think he finishes his career at IMG. I think he ends up transferring back to Oklahoma and finishing his high school out doing, doing that. Uh, I know his family wanted him to play here at IMG. Now, I can't say that for certain. I know that's kind of what his heart is. He's told me that a thousand times. I want to go back to Oklahoma. I love being home. And he misses being home. And I think that that's another thing that works in Oklahoma's favor, regardless of his family liking him, seeing and being away and being out of the state and all that. He's got a sister that goes to OU, and he wants to be back home. So eventually, I think this thing works out for Oklahoma with David Stone. And I'll say that until I'm blue in the face. As far as Oklahoma goes on the recruiting trail of 2023, it's far from over. You still have the transfer portal, and you still have some big pieces laying out there waiting to be had by Oklahoma. And I promise you this, Parker and I talked about this when we after all this, and I was driving back, back to my hotel. There's going to be a player that we're not talking about right now. We have no clue who it is. 
He's going to take an official visit to Oklahoma and could potentially be in this class. We don't know who it is. Could it be a big name? We don't know. We're just sitting here telling you they were notorious for doing that at Clemson. Coming in late, swooping in, and making a big push. And sometimes even landing the guy. So there's going to be another name that we're not talking about right now in the defensive line that they go out and they start pushing for, and they'll get the kid on campus. You watch. You watch. And and with that being said, I still think this class ends up between, what did you say, five, between five and eight? Is that what you said? Five and eight. That was the range I put. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say five and eight, maybe four and eight. I, I think yeah, and the, there's a world that this class still could end up being a top three or four class. There's still a world that can happen. You now they got to land Johnny Bowen. They got to land Peyton Bowen. They got to get land Yates and they got to land Akana. If they land all four of those guys, they're number two. Like that's how close this is right now. So don't, don't get too depressed. Be mad. Be mad. You deserve to be mad. Your OU fans deserve to be pissed off. Everybody deserves to be pissed off about this. Be mad. But if Oklahoma goes out and plays well on Saturday, like we think they will, get over it, move on. And then you got to see what Oklahoma does on the recruiting trail from here because they're going to have a bunch of big names at the OU Texas game and they're going to have a bunch of big names at the OU Kansas game. From there, we'll see how this, this cycle lands out. But you've got time, folks. You have time, so be patient. All right, that's going to do it for this version of the OU Insider Under the Visor YouTube Live. My name is Brandon Drum. If you're not signed up for OU Insider, it's $1 for the first month, $9.95 afterwards. Or you can sign up right now, 30% off, $75, gets you all of OU Insider, all of 24-7 sports. You can go check out the texting inside if you want, USC, whatever. If you're signed up full year, you can search to your heart's desire across the 24 seven platform. And there's 250 sites. Plus you get all the national guys. Um, also make sure you're subscribed to this channel. This channel has exploded. We can't thank you guys enough for that. And a lot of you guys that are watching aren't subscribed. So be sure you subscribe to this channel. Cause we have a lot of content coming for you guys here, not just this week, but all through the season. Parker, go ahead. TCU preview coming tomorrow with our guy over at hornfrogblitz.com, mm -hmm. Jeremy Clark. A pregame podcast coming Friday. Yep. Obviously, game content all day Saturday. Postgame podcast comes your way Sunday. Then we turn it all back over next week. Yep. Always content flowing eager every day on here. So make sure you guys subscribe to that. Make sure you guys are on OU Insider VIP because a lot of the stuff we do here, it's very general, very non descriptive, but we get down and dirty on OU Insider VIP and there is notes. Notes, 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 and news that you will not find anywhere else uh, covering Oklahoma sports. And we take very much pride in being, we think, the foremost and the most affirmative uh, network and, and website that there is covering the University of Oklahoma football. So we thank you guys for subscribing to this channel and to OU Insider VIP. Uh, that's going to do it once again for the OU Insider. Advisor. Sooner is YouTube Live for Brand for Parker Thune. I'm Brandon Drum. For Parker Thune, my name is Brandon Drum. We'll see you guys later.